Sadasiditi shabdartha bede dvai gunyama patet abede punya rukti syan mai vang loketa tekshanat. The opponent says, In the Vedic text, existence was sat asit. If the two words mean differently, then two separate things come in. If the words refer to the same thing, then there is tautology. The Vedantin replies, Not that. That is, the two terms certainly refer to the same thing, but identical statements like this are seen in usage. Sat and asit both are derived from the root as, which signifies existence. If the two are accepted as referring to two things, the idea of secondless Brahman is affected. Both refer to the same thing, but the use of two words cannot be a fault because it is common in usage. Text 37 Kartavyang kurute vakyang brute dharasya dharanam we all use the expressions, what has to be done has been done. Speech is spoken, and a burden is born. The Vedic text, existence was, is meant for those whose minds are accustomed to such expressions. Text 38 Kalabhave pure chukti kalavasanaya yutam shishyang pratyevate natra dvitiyang nahi sankhyate. Such texts as before creation, spoken in reference to Brahman who is timeless, are meant for beginners who are used to the idea of time. They do not imply the existence of duality. The beginners are not capable of comprehending the Absolute right at the start. So the past tense is used to make the sense intelligible to a pupil who is bound to the idea of time. Text 39 Chodyang va pariharo va kriyatang dvaita bhashaya Advaita bhāsaya chodyang nasti nāpi tadutaram. Objections are raised and answered from the point of view of duality. From the standpoint of pure non-duality, neither questions nor answers are possible. Duality is assumed to refute it. Arguments are possible through the mind and speech, which are the world of duality. In non-duality, silence is the only language. Text 40 Tadas dimita gambhirang natejo natamastatam anakya manabhivyaktang satking chit avashishyate What remains after dissolution is an unmoving and ungraspable unnamed and unnameable, unmanifest, indefinite something beyond light and darkness, and all-pervading. A quotation from Yoga Vasishta. Namaste. So the opponents, which could be the Buddhists, or it could even be the Neo-Advaitans, or even the dualistic believers in the personal gods and so on, they object to the use of language 
saying that, well, you're saying that everything is ultimately non-dual, but here you are using language which is dualistic and often repetitive. And the answer is, eh, so what? <laughs> We have to use language, and language is, by its own nature, dualistic. What to do? Because in language, there is a speaker and a hearer. There is an originator and a receiver. There is, in other words, a subject and an object. So it's dual. We can't get around that. Because in the beginning, Everybody is dualist. Try to understand. Like just down the street from me, there's a big Catholic church. And it's Sunday morning, so everybody's in the church repeating the catechism, you know, and the mass and all that. The same words, the same thing over and over again. I mean, God must really be tired of hearing this repetitive, you know, impersonal speech over and over again. Like, why don't you get it? Well, they can't get it. They have to believe in duality because to them, it's the only reality. So to reach people who are, to use the plain word, ignorant, one must use language and one must speak to this misunderstanding that reality is dualistic. Otherwise, it's impossible to communicate. Now, when you have very advanced students who are like right on the verge of enlightenment, one does not have to use words. One can only use vibes, you know, and silence. So this is, for example, in the pastime of Dakshina Murti, when Lord Shiva enlightened the five sages by simply sitting in silence. Or in the famous flower sermon of the Buddha, when Buddha was going to speak and he simply held up a flower. Huh? And only one of the hearers got it. But, you know, that's another story. Or in the past times of Ramana Maharshi, sometimes someone would ask, well, what is Samadhi? Or what is Brahman? And he would simply go silent. Lose the ego and stare off into space. What else can you say? Because anything you say will be in duality. So the Neo-Advaitans in particular like to pound on this point. Huh? But all they're doing is revealing their ignorance. Because if you make any statement at all, it is dualistic. Yes, we know this. Huh? We know it quite well. On the other hand, how are we going to reach people who are ignorant without using language? It's simply not possible. So from a practical point of view, use of language is necessary. And of course, some of the statements are going to be tautological. You know, like reality is real. Yeah. <laughs> but only... Brahman is real, because only Brahman exists without any conditions, without any boundaries, without beginning or end. And therefore, only Brahman is pure consciousness, pure, unconditioned self-awareness, without any obstacle, without any boundary, without any end. Everything else is bounded. For example, the consciousness of the body and the senses and the mind. Huh? This all goes away when the body is finished at death. 
And the mind simply gathers its memories together and picks up and leaves and goes to another body. So even though we're dependent on language in the dualistic state, the truths of Brahman can be stated well enough that if someone actually sits down and does the practice, they can get it. So it is possible to describe the practice in dualistic language because the practice is simple. Sit down, <laughs> keep your mind still, keep your body erect uh, with the spine in a straight line, look within, uh, maybe the eyes stare off into space, or maybe they look sort of at the tip of the nose, but they're not focused there. The vision is focused within. And what is there? Uh, what do I see when I turn out the light? I can't tell you, but I know it's mine. <laughs> The Beatles songs are somehow really right on. Can't tell you what I see when I close my eyes at night because it's formless. Maybe it's a kind of shifting light, you know, which is nothing but the light of the self reflected in the moving mind. The mind is always moving. So, Anything that we say, the next moment is going to be untrue because things change. That's the nature of the material world. That's the nature of duality. Whatever we say is a lie in the sense that we're talking about something non-dual as the substrate of everything. So that cannot be explained in words. Only the phenomena superimposed on it can be expressed to a certain extent in language. Oh, but the Neo-Edwaitans love to bring up that phrase from the Tao Te Ching, that those who speak do not know, those who know do not speak. That's a great hammer to smash any argument, right? Except it's dumb. It's dumb because that eliminates any possibility of educating people in the truth or even showing them the way to reach the truth. So it's a very kind of hard, uncompassionate stance to take. And we see this with the Buddhists and the Neo-Edwaitans, that they're much lacking in compassion. That is to say, they don't really care about helping other people to understand. They simply want to show off their own superiority and their ability to smash any argument. Well, yeah, of course, any argument can be smashed because it's couched in the language of duality, which is the only language there is. So if we are going to help people, if we're going to bring people to the point where they can do the practice that leads to enlightenment, we have to educate them. And language is the only means we have. So even from the point of view of Brahman, from the point of view of non-duality, we use language to gradually point out where Brahman is, like the finger pointing at the moon, or like using the tree and the branch of the tree to point out a small star in the sky. They're only a help. They're only a pointer. But these words are valuable because they lead to ultimate self-realization. Aum Tat Sat. Aung Shakti Aung Aung Namah Shivaya <laughs>